Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is interesting, exciting, and I have the perfect group with me to do this. Uh, you must observe that we ensured that when we decode the report, we bring in a marketer perspective, a practitioner perspective, a, a, a perspective from, a, from an OEM standpoint, a perspective from a software standpoint, keeping in mind that they also represent their organizations as marketers themselves. So that's a great combination to have out here to discuss a very important study, which we think really sets the tone for 2024. You've already seen the study. We've discussed this amongst ourselves. And what we want to do is use some of the highlights to get a point of view from each of you, right? So for, there are some questions which I'd like all of you to participate in, and there's some which I'll address to some of you specifically. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which I'd like everyone to chip into. So I really like this data point, and there's merit in really helping us bring it alive. You know, we asked uh, up our respondents on what is the key challenge as to why AI adoption is limited at this point in time. And there was 54% of the respondents who said that they currently lack the right understanding on adoption of AI in marketing and they probably haven't effectively understood it, right? So as, uh, you know, as marketing professionals, as experts, are you facing a similar challenge whilst you're attempting to adopt AI? Uh, is this also an issue at your various organizations that you represent? Uh, maybe we can start with Prashant. Yeah, sure, I can start. So, uh, no, absolutely, I think, Monica, uh, the data point uh, is, uh, you know, strikingly accurate, yeah? So, every possibly one in two people or, like, partners, both internal and external I meet, uh, you know, I see this sense. There are, there's a clear distinction. There are people who are excited about it. They're making progress every week. They are adopting it in every single process they have. They are re-evaluating current processes. And then there is, you know, this almost uh, opposite set, which is wishing it away. The, uh, you know, there are people saying that, okay, let me do the least possible. Let me pay some lip service and so on. Right? So there is, uh, you know, clearly this uh, two sets of people and uh, some who are not still realizing the inevitability of, uh, you know, adoption. Uh, and I think that's reflected in the study. Yeah, so very much uh, the same experience. Okay, fair enough. Neeraj, your take? Pretty much, uh, pretty much aligned with uh, the findings there. Because I think uh, the, what do you call, the skill to handle these platforms, that remains a bigger worry with a lot of brands, especially when they see a lot of negative news in the market. Like the record number of lawsuits which are being filed against platforms like Midjourney. So a lot of people are wary of using these platforms or they are really wary of getting into a, you know, a legal kind of a tussle. But uh, there's where we chip in. We are basically trying to uh, create guardrails or build platforms which are more legally compliant or getting our clients to dwell with rights cleared content as we call it while we are building a lot of uh, image gallery or experiences for marketing out there. So yeah, what uh, the industry needs or what our clients or marketers need is constant skilling in this particular space, which is a lot of new platforms which are emerging by the day. And the choice of platform is super critical. How do you play in this space? We'll, we'll come to that. Super. We'll, so we'll I'm, I'm, with the, I'm, piece. I'm with the findings of the study. Uh, in fact, I also picked up that particular the skilling point while I was picking up the survey there. Interesting. So, Kunal, what's your take? Do you think lack of effective understanding is the challenge why adoption is low-key? So, you know, it takes me back to when I was a junior marketer. And that's when um, um, social media, you know, I was really making inroads into corporate space. Right? It had gained popularity uh, amongst the masses, but then, you know, corporates were just trying to understand what can they do and how can they gain. And uh, I remember that, um, funnily enough, um, so I, I, that at point, that point in time, I was working with an organization which was really a, a slow mover into that space. And uh, what, what happened then was I ended up presenting to the CEO and a bunch of board members. Why? Because there was not enough understanding in the broader marketing group about how do you, you know, present this 
how do you kind of showcase the value of social media and mm. being there right mm. uh, so in any sort of a change right that happens in our industry what i've always seen is a there is uh, barriers like cultural change right so there's a cultural barrier for us to kind of uh, get through there is an awareness barrier and there's an element to education i think uh, neeraj just said you know alluded to that and then there are barriers like uh, you know um, fear of the unknown right it's the oldest and possibly one of the most primal instincts that we have and finally the last point i had to say you know would would be you know how does this talk back how does ai talk back to the business objectives that you have is there a clear road map right and i think that's a that's a minefield of its own and we can cover that a little more but i think those are the three most important barriers for ai to really get there and i don't think we are there right makes sense interesting point what's your take aruna so i have had a completely different experience within my team i mean we started experimenting with ai i think about 6 to 8 months ago and um, i think the team uh, was divided in two parts so we had the youngsters who actually jumped at wanting to experiment with platforms wanting to work with it wanting to decode it and understand it and obviously people like me who are of another generation you know had our own views and thoughts about it but it you know it goes back to uh, a you know a thing which has been constant in in the history of marketing for all time when you have something new come up there is always one set that wants to go ahead experiment and be the first mover in you know any case and there are the others who will you know think about everything else that goes upside downside and because we you know we follow a certain chain of thought like the, the best example that comes to mind is kodak i mean kodak owned the market on cameras for the longest time possible and you know they possibly uh, didn't see the digital camera coming although the story goes there was one person who did see it coming and nobody listened to him and he went on to work with apple and you know the rest is history so in every organization i think you will find there will be sorry any glitch there you want us to stop for a minute yeah just one sec just give us a couple of minutes some tech glitch yeah carry on so you you will always have two sets of people and um honestly speaking the generation of now uh, the younger marketers who are coming into uh, the field are a lot more enthusiastic about uh, handling new technologies working with them and even if they don't understand they're happy to decode uh, but as long as you have the oldies around uh, we'll still have questions about karna hai nahi karna hai kyun karna hai matlab you know why spoil the apple cart as it's going so so that's a good point you're making basically you're passing the back or the buck back on leadership that they got to kind of have it as a learning Let agenda but this way i'm passing the buck back at me because i am part of leadership yeah yeah absolutely so, i mean at the end of the day unless i move forward and understand my team uh, which is again coming back to what we did we actually got the oldies to experience it first so uh, the the fact is now the entire team is gung ho about it so yeah push the oldies out and you know push them to just how real an answer is that thank you so much thank you so much okay So moving on to the next question which I'm sure a lot of people here in the room also would be very curious to understand and it's extremely coincidental that the data point here matched with the poll we just fired a while back so our, our study says 69% of the respondents say that skill and training is the top challenge for inclusion of AI in marketing so the question for neeraj and for kunal i'd like both of you to take the lead and feel free to chip in uh, you know prashant and aruna so the the question to you guys is a how important is skilling and b what are the kind of processes you think are key to have to ensure ongoing skilling for ai to be embraced to the extent it should be yeah should i go first kunal yeah absolutely go ahead So I think two two prompt approach is what we are taking. One is uh, we are conducting massive roadshows. Uh, a lot of our global folks, even the legal folks, we have created a, a module which is about navigating uh, generative AI from legal perspective. 
and that's pretty much opened up for all marketers across the planet where uh, our best legal counselors globally they get into a call and they kind of form up the narrative in terms of what is the landscape looking like which are the large language models available what are the nuances around it and they are uh, pretty much coaching them especially the legal folks out there because even for them it's a new vertical altogether so there's one level of coaching which is getting driven from the legal front and the second uh, area of work which we're doing wonderfully well is uh, we are beta testing a lot of these pilots out there with our clients and that's something we've been historically doing as part of the creative tech practice at WPP which is pretty much like trend spotting and trend shaping as we call it. So there's a constant, uh, uh, what do you call, an ecosystem and anything which is new requires a ecosystem which needs to be created and a small pilots which needs to be rolled out very carefully. And in this case, I think legal plays a super important role. And once we have these pilots in place, so we are activating generative AI pretty much in all three formats, which is text, voice, and video. You saw Google speak about the birthday platform, which is our creation, uh, or the platform which we are now creating, which is rendering text to video or getting cross platforms to talk to each other. So I would love to play a use how case. How do you ensure skilling when you build these platforms? How are you ensuring internal skilling and skilling at the clients? So that's what I'm coming to. So when we do these small pilots with big brands and we showcase it up into our experience center, which then becomes open for all the clients to kind of follow. When they come in, we show them the platforms, the potential and nuances attached to the platform, what all is possible as on date. And, and that kind of helps us skill these guys. So as we speak, we've got about 50 top clients across uh, markets who've been visiting our experience center. And the target is uh, about hosting about 200 odd clients and then scale, going for the ultimate scale on these platforms, I would say. So one is legal counseling, the other one is a lot of show and tell. Makes sense. An actual experience center where they get to play with the platforms. Understood. Other than it remains in a presentation somewhere. Got it. Got it. Uh, Kunal, your take? You know, I was... Uh, just before the pandemic, right, I was reading up a report uh, by OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I remember that uh, even before AI, I mean, before the advent of generative AI, they mentioned that 14% of jobs across the world are possibly going to get completely automated. And another 32% are going to be completely transformed. Right? So that's a bit of a sobering thought if you take it in, in that spirit, right? So what's happening today, and they, by the way, this was before generative AI, before the digital transformation that COVID really catalyzed it, right? So uh, what's happening today is there's a, there's a big change in the way organizations are looking at, you know, skilling. And that's become a focus across the industry. So there's a lot of focus on upskilling at the moment. Um, considering that, you know, again, HBR, I was, I was, I would quote to HBR, they recently came up with a report which said that the half-life of skills today is five years, right? And uh, furthermore, in tech, it's two and a half years. Now, what that means is that while organizations are on that journey of upskilling, right, um, upskilling in, in, might just work in the short term, but I have a very strong feeling that we would need complete reskilling as we kind of really go forward, right? And uh, that's the, the conversation that we are having with our clients as well, as to how do you kind of, you know, reskill, because the future, uh, the sort of jobs that we might have today may not be the ones that we have, do in the future, right? So, um, and we're kind of talking about that a lot with not just our clients, but also we're working very closely with, um, you know, a Ministry of uh, Electronics and IT, uh, at, the, at the union as well as at the state levels. Um, our ethical AI head is, happens to be on the um, National AI Council advising President Biden and his committee. So point is, I think, uh, and skill, by the way, is the number one challenge that is on the government's agenda. So, um, and that's going to come up very, very uh, often, you know. So. Fantastic. I think you nailed it there because what we're basically saying is we're not talking about skilling, we're talking about reskilling, right? We have to start from scratch. So we have to do reskilling and the worry should be, will we lose jobs to AI? No. Will we lose jobs to human beings who are skilled with AI? Yes. So I think that's what Kunal alluded to and that totally helps. Thank you so much. Okay, now there's another very interesting concern area which sort of comes in the way of adopting AI, um, you know, in a very active way. 
uh, and which is risk management, right? Risk management is an area of concern, A, because like Neeraj pointed out, again, there is no uh, formal training on how do you handle, like at one point, time, point in time, we used to talk about how do you handle things like ORM, online reputation management, and all those, you know, trolls that came for, uh, came brands ways, and we cracked it with a lot of trial and error. Now is another one, which is about AI risk management, right? Where there is, the study says 72% see data privacy as a primary risk whilst considering Gen AI adoption. Right? So if that is the number we are talking about, then what is the approach to build uh, you know, processes around risk management and how are you all attempting doing so? Maybe Prashant, we'll start with you and Aruna, you can then take over. Sure. So, uh, so two parts to my answer, right? Uh, see, firstly, I think uh, start with core organizational values. Yeah. And ask yourselves, does your organization and everybody, you know, kind of working there is clear about those values? So in our case, uh, you know, in the case of HP, when we started off uh, the, you know, 40 odd projects on AI globally, we said, hey, do we first need an AI governance framework? And we realized that most of the issues can actually be addressed by our existing values framework because we have a very strong existing values framework. You know, being doing good for people, for partners, for the, for the planet, if those values are so steeped in your organization, I think you will get a lot more confidence of going ahead. And therefore, anything intentionally will not go wrong. Yeah. Mm. And then there's the second piece of saying, what is my AI governance framework? which will help me ward off things which can unintentionally go wrong. People will make mistakes, right, when they are adopting new technology. And that's where AI governance can possibly play a big role. So I think existing frameworks and, I mean, every organization who is a GDPR signatory is handling customer data, today has a data privacy framework. If you are in the internet, uh, you know, world, then you have a cybersecurity framework. And I think those fundamentals and they need to be the pillars of what your you know governance framework stands on yeah makes sense and aruna what do you have to say so i'll just add to that that you know while every organization does have a dna and a framework that they follow you know where possibly things can fall through the cracks is when uh, functions don't talk to each other right when you have your legal you have your digital you have your marketing um, you have your pr and you have you know, every other function working in silos, they understand the framework, yes. They imbibe the DNA, yes. But what happens is if all of these are not talking to each other, you know, somebody makes a mistake, you don't know about it. And it's not just internal, it also has to extend to all the, you know, uh, agencies that we work with, right? So if we say, for example, we're working with Group M and, you know, we're uh, learning from them and they're learning from us, it should be an open, transparent network where while the data is obviously sacrosanct, the learnings should be, you know, easily available to everybody. So cross-functional uh, compatibility on the existing frameworks and, you know, cross-agency compatibility on existing frameworks. I think that is what will help us keep data private and, you know, mitigate any risk that may come through. That's actually a very, very realistic way of putting it. And I, I'm, I really appreciate both of you gave a very realistic point of view because I don't think we can shy away from embracing it because AI is the good scary platform which is here to stay, you like it or not. So might as well be open to take risks but do the basics right like Prashant and Aruna you just shared. Okay, so now that we've set a general tone to AI, let's move to Gen AI, yeah. Of course, Gen AI is like galloping way faster than any other form of AI at this point in time, right? In fact, our study shows 85% of marketers are exploring some or, the gen, or some or the other Gen AI application. Now, that's a big number, right? So basically, there is therefore a need to be able to create more and more use cases, which can help uh, you know, improve adoption because all of them are at different life stages when it comes to using Gen AI, right? So would you uh, probably, and Neeraj, I'll start with you and then we can get uh, Aruna and Prashant also to chip in. Would you be able to share some use cases from your organization on Gen AI adoption? 
All right. So, like I mentioned, uh, it's pretty much firing up for us globally on all three formats, which is text, voice, and video. I think their brands are owning up certain moments. So, like the birthday uh, moment is being owned by Mondelez in that sense, right? So, we went a step ahead and we were doing a lot of pilots out there, toiling around with a lot of these platforms. And we said, why can't we mash a couple of platforms and then create an experience on a platform which is closer to consumer? So, look at WhatsApp in India. If you see smartphone about 600, 650 million, WhatsApp sits at 580 million. If you were to plug in cross platform and create an experience for a consumer on WhatsApp, that's going to be mind blowing. So, that's one, one use case is what we are chasing, wherein we were looking at mashing multiple platforms and creating a wow experience for the consumers out there with multiple Gen AI platforms which are working in the, in the scenes background. So for example, we did something for Britannia, which is on WhatsApp. So you can go there and while the World Cup series was on, you can ask Ravi Shastri any cricket related questions. So while you punch in a question on WhatsApp, the query goes to chat GPT. And mind you, on either sides, we are putting in a profinity layer. So mm. even on the input as well as the output. So when the query goes to chat GPT, it renders a response. If the profinity, it goes through the profinity layer, it renders a response which then goes to an AI avatar of Ravi Shastri we created and then we render text to video. So for a consumer, it's pretty much seamless when you ask a question over WhatsApp and now you have India's ex-coach giving you a cricketing advice and that too on the World Cup season. So let's just play that uh, AV Ranjana, they'll get a fair sense in terms of what am I talking about. Where it's going to play? It's right behind us, okay. Okay, what's this? Call your boss in a croaky voice and tell them you're feeling under the weather. So it also... Right, got it. 20 seconds. That's about it. So it also goes with the brand thematic, which is all about Golmal, right? The product proposition. So whatever you ask him, we actually engineered AI with some rock solid prompt engineering to give a Golmal answer, which is a quirky point of view which is not the right point of view, but something really quirky and that's, mind you, that's very tough. Yes. So th these are the kind of use cases which are picking up. Globally, one of my personal favorites is uh, what uh, AKQA did with Serena Williams, where they got the digital twin of Serena Williams, 17 years, Serena Williams playing against 35 year old. Right. This was the Nike one, if you follow yeah. that. Or those letters which those warriors had written in the past in World War II. There was a AI engineered platform which was created to convert those texts into images on what, what state they were in when they wrote those letters to their families, right? That, that's again a classic example. Or the outpainting work which uh, was being done Nestle globally. So tons of work, tons of inspirational work and as I keep saying, uh, there is a, a scary side of AI but it has real power to make a difference in terms of creating really positive campaigns which can create positive impact. Like for, for example, we are working on a use case wherein we are creating something for people who cannot see, but they can talk. So using the power of AI, they can just paint something through their words. Right. And then we will get a paint brand to kind of own up those platforms and sell those piece of arts and give that money back to the fraternity. Makes sense. Interesting. Prashant, you guys have been doing some interesting work in AI as well. Would you like to share some use cases which can sort of throw some light? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's so many, but uh, so let me pick up one which is critical or let's say uh, unique to our category. So PCs and uh, printers, services, uh, particularly commercial services, uh, you know, highly researched category, right? So uh, typically a customer spends uh, two to four weeks researching, understanding uh, or translating her use case into, a, you know, deciding what product to buy. And therefore, every customer asks unique questions, right? So, we sell about a million units a month, but we get about 10 million queries, like a day, okay? That's the kind of scale, because everyone's asking like 20 things about, oh, will this work for me? Because once you buy the device, you're stuck with it for three years, right? So, you really want to be sure. And therefore, uh, what we're doing is that we're just scraping the internet, going around looking for what are people asking and we're dynamically generating content which answers those questions, right? So whether it's a Quora or a YouTube or a, uh, a, you know, a forum, we just don't wait for the customer to call up my customer care. I know that she's asking that question somewhere and we generate AI ML generated videos 
or just text content blogs which specifically answer those questions and therefore just improve viability of your product. So that's just one. Otherwise, lots of examples in discoverability of the brand. And then in memorability, I think, uh, is where uh, we want to do more. I think wonderful example, Neeraj, uh, very, very memorable activation. So I think something like that we would want to do. And then there's the community aspect of it, right? Uh, there are communities emerging across the internet on special interests, like for, uh, you know, learning or uh, teaching a three-year-old how to write her first letters, right? So those are the kind of stuff we are trying to solve through Gen AI. Very interesting. I'm going to take one last question. And uh, Aruna, you could take the lead here. And Kunal, uh, please uh, chime in once we hear from Aruna. Basically, now that we know there is potential and we know it is the way forward, uh, what do you think are the measures or the methods which can really help uh, you know, increase the potential of adopting AI at scale and what do we as an industry need to do to be able to encourage more and more adoption? The first thing about, uh, you know, increasing adoption of AI is, as I said, you come back to the earlier question, there needs to be a lot more, uh, you know, back and forth or ideation or brainstorming between, you know, marketers, their agencies, their, uh, you know, teams, even, you know, include legal, digital, include your entire organization into first having a conversation on where all can you use AI, okay. right? Um, it need not just be a marketing uh, thing, but you know, through marketing you can lead, you can go through multiple other places. So for example, we're life insurance. We probably be as boring a sector as you can make it out to be. Uh, and on, for us, the biggest thing is how do I engage that consumer from the time he walks into my portal to the time he, you know, has to file his premium or get his claim. Now, is that my own, is it that a marketing journey only? No. It's a journey that has multiple, multiple parts, but that experience has to be the same all through. Now, if while I get him in, you know, the company saying, you know, look at AI, this is how you can do, very nice, great social media, great, you know, creatives, what happens after? Right, the adoption of AI in any organization, especially which is not as FMCG focused as, uh, you know, or a sector as dry as BFSI, will always need a lot of other adoptions to take place for a, uh, for a consumer to be having that same experience also. That will lead to business, that will lead to further adoption, that will lead to further collaboration, and that will lead to, you know, a, a whole lot more conversations around the subject. That makes sense. And Kunal, what would you say? I think, uh, you know, uh, this is a collaborative effort yeah. and everyone is a stakeholder here, right? So you've got um, three things I think super important. One is how can the community come together to raise the level of awareness? Right? It goes back to the first data point that we saw, the level of awareness of AI and understanding of AI in the industry, right? Correct. And uh, we are all on different, different uh, maturity curves there. So it, there's a need for us to come together and for example, come up with something like the state of AI report, so that it kind of informs the leaders out there. Uh, there's a very great data point out there in the report which said that there are around 32% of uh, the influence lies, influence of, of driving the charter of AI is, is goes back to the CEO, right? Uh, so, you know, how do you That's kind of come together to inform the leaders to make choices, right? Second is, I think, um, the uh, the collaborative effort. I think, uh, I think uh, again, Aruna referred to that, so I won't expand on it. But the last piece is um, the ethical guidelines. Again, um, there's a lot of, there, it's a minefield, right? And that's also stopping decision making, guys. So what's happening yeah. is, uh, there's a fear of the unknown. There's, there's insecurity, which stems from that. And then uh, there is a legal minefield, there's financial risks, reputational risks. Um, there is technological risks, lack of skills. So there's a lot to deal with, right? So decision making and of, of things like Gen AI uh, in the corporate boardroom is not an easy battle to fight. So I think that again uh, uh, needs a community to come together to define an, eth you know, an ethical guideline, right? Uh, and what that looks like. What are the basic foundations that we need to consider, right? fairness, equit equitability, uh, accountability, transparency, trust, because there's a very big deficit of trust at the moment, right? And I think that's the, that's the real key. Makes sense. So basically what we're saying so is… Kunal is saying, come to my experience center. 
more show and tell. <laughs> yeah, so basically what we're saying is let's shed the inhibition. Let's try and create stories which we can tell more and more of our industry uh, folks to be able to adopt and be inspired. And of course, let's make a conscious and collaborative effort together to learn from each other. And I think that's where the needle will move. Uh, I think this report has really come alive with all the perspectives all of you have shared. I know time is up, but if I can do one last question, which you have to answer in one word, okay? Yes, one word. Linda then, uh, so let's let's give this a shot. Uh, future of AI in data. Future of AI in data marketing. One word to tell us. Say thank you. <laughs> uh, I think it's indispensable is the Fantastic. word. Fantastic. I like it. Neeraj, future of AI in data marketing. I think creativity. Okay. That's super critical. Okay. What will you create? Is that AI can create those ripples in the industry? Okay. That communication, creative thought. Well, One now, word, creativity. I think endless possibilities. Okay. Aruna? Inevitable. Sorry? Inevitable. It's just a matter of time. Well, that's well said. And thank you so much. Appreciate your participation. I'd like all of you to get a copy of the report and do a photo op with us, please.